Now, what I'm going to be doing today is going through the Ethel and Archie example. I'll show you how to do it, or how you, you could have done it. It's going to take you a little bit into what you're going to learn next week, but at least you'll get started on it, and it will give you an insight into how to approach issues like that. Now, Ethel and Archie is very simplified. So the, the thing that you were asked to do was to give um, an explanation, write an explanation for each line. And when you get the solution, you'll see that I've, that I've given examples of what you should write, but not every line. So the ones that are not included in the solution, don't forget, you needed to do them as well. But there's 23 notes that you get when I give you the solution that goes through all that. So you're going to get that piece of paper quite soon, 4 o'clock, I think, this afternoon. Now, the whole point of this exercise was to make sure that you understood where to find the bits of information you need in a financial statement. That's either in an income statement or in a balance sheet. I'm not worrying about the statement of cash flows at this time. So you were given a very simple income statement, a very simple um, balance sheet. And it was up to you to then identify which bits belong together so you could actually use them to draw some conclusions. Um, can someone bring him up to speed? The way I'm going to do this, I'm just going to go briefly through it. In terms of what you would say, you'd have to say about this one, income statement, you'd have to say what an income statement is. So your 20 words you'd say, this is an income statement which shows the financial performance of a business over a period of time. That's something like that. And then the next line down, and this is, every time you do a financial statement, you have to put the date or the period it covers into that statement. So this line is saying what the period is that's covered by the statement. The assumption is it's going to be a year, but it's not always a year, so you've got to be careful to make sure you look at that carefully. Uh, the next line gives you the names of the two businesses. So you should have said, this line shows the names of the two businesses whose financial statements these are. Line after that, this shows us the type of business. Now, you wouldn't normally get that, except it's part of the business name. So you're getting the name split across two lines, really. And the reason you're getting that in this case is to draw your attention to the fact it's two different types of businesses. It's like you wouldn't, would you compare a shipping company to an airline? They're both in the travel industry, but it doesn't mean you can compare them. And these are both shops, but they're different types of industries, or different types of shops. And then you get the first line, which is sales revenue. So you'd say this, is the sale, this line shows the sale revenue for the period um, for the year ended 20, 31st December 2021. So it's a sales revenue for the year of 2021 for each of the shops. And you keep going down through it. When you get to um, something like gross profit, gross profit is an accounting term. You would, in your description, you'd say what gross profit is. So you'd say this line shows gross profit, which is the difference between the revenue and the cost of the goods that were sold. In other words, you're taking the name of the first line and the second line and just writing in words some formula that gets you the gross profit. And you should, um, whenever you see one of these, if it's something prepared by yourselves, always check the arithmetic to make sure that if I made it up, I've not put in a, a mistake so that it would catch you out later. So always just make sure that what you're seeing is right. Um, in real life, you wouldn't expect to see mistakes, but you'd be surprised. Right, then you get salesperson salaries. So you just see the things, you know, this is salesperson salaries, and so on you go. I'm not going to dwell on, on this any longer, except to point out that in some cases, like in the case of rent, it's only one business paying rent. And in the case of, uh, where is it, interest, there's only one business paying interest. Now, as you're looking at that, having done all the, the labels, as you're looking at this, the statements, things like that are things you should be looking for because they show a difference in the way that the business is run or the business operates. 
So it gives you clues as to what you might expect or not expect. And if one business is paying interest, well, interest on what? Yeah, a loan. Yeah. Um, so you'd expect to see a loan in the balance sheet. And if you don't see that, well, that's different. Now, you might see a, a case where it's actually interest received. So you'd be expecting to see some sort of funds in a bank somewhere for that. The other one, which is rent. One of the businesses is renting somewhere. That means it's, well, it doesn't own all the property it's using. But the other business isn't renting. So what does that mean about the property it's using in the business? Yeah, it's, it belongs to the business. So it's going to be that, whatever it is, the building, the shop, is going to be in the balance sheet. So it's, a, it's sort of giving you a, a, a check, if you like, that you've understood the balance sheet right. Because when you go through the balance sheet, you'll be looking for these things. And if you find them, well, you know, you followed it. And if you start with the balance sheet, you'd be expecting to see interest because there's a loan. In the income statement, you'd be expecting to see rent if they haven't got any buildings. Because they must be operating somewhere. Now, going down here, you get a figure for total expenses. And the total expenses figure, of, in the case of Archie, 208, and you get 240 up here as the gross profit. And the way that accounting works in an income statement is you take the cost of the goods you sell away from your revenue to get gross profit, which is what's done here. Then you add up all your expenses and take that away from gross profit to get the final profit for the period. That's called net profit. So when you're writing a description of this, or of the net profit line, this line here, you uh, should say this is the amount of, how would you say it? This is what's left after deducting all of the expenses for the year from the revenue for the year. That's a good way of saying it, but something like that. Now, this line is quite interesting. Drawings. Doesn't show up so well over there, I see it pretty well here. Right, the drawings line. Now, if you look above the drawings line, you've got the net profit, 32,000 and 60,000. So at that point, that's saying to you that Ethel is making more money. She's making 60,000, Archie's only making 32,000. Well, that means must, the immediate reaction to that is it must be a better business. Then you come to drawings and you find that Archie's taking out 16,000. So he's taking out 50% and, Arch and Ethel's taking out 48,000, which is 75%, no, it's not, it's 80%, is it? It's 48,000 of 60,000. Yeah, she's taking out 80%. Now, more successful business, but much more of the profits being taken out. So if you were, the question is, which one of these would you invest in? Would you, you'd invest in Archie? No, Ethel? In Archie. Archie, yeah. I mean, that could be the answer, it might not be the answer. But it's not obvious because you don't know why um, Ethel's taking out that 48 grand. Why is it that she's taking so much out and Archie's taking so little out? I mean, Ethel is working 18 hours a day. It's a supermarket, a little mini market. Now, I've got a mini market near me, and the, the man who owns it, he opens up in the middle of the night, and he shuts in the middle of the night. It's open from, I think it's 5.36 a.m. until 11 p.m. So he's working long hours, so he'll want a lot back. Archie's got a hardware store. How many, how, who's ever seen a place like, in this country, we have B&Q. Who's ever seen a big a hardware store who's selling hammers and nails and things open in the middle of the night, open after eight o'clock. So he's working less hours. So he's going to take less out. So that might be explaining that. So you think about these things because they all get involved. If you're going to take over the business and you take over Ethel's business, you might have to work very long hours to get a profit like she's getting. If you take over Archie's business, you might only have to work eight hours, 10 hours to get the profit he's making. And if you look at a salesperson, Salaries, they're both roughly paying the same. I mean, there's not a huge difference between that. Now you come down to the balance sheet. Uh, 
And the first of all, you see that, oh, wait a minute, uh, just finish on that, retained profits. Archie's retained 16, which means he's kept it back so as he can use it in the future in the business. She's only kept back 12,000, so Ethel's not needing so much to be kept back. So that might tell you something about the risks of the business. Maybe Archie needs to keep more funds in the business in case there's a downturn of trade or something. Um, right, going into the balance sheet. You've got the assets of the bank. Sorry, you've got assets. And the first one is Cashit Bank, which is what you'd expect. Now, Cashit Bank is, is just a, an old-fashioned way of saying bank. It doesn't mean cash. It means bank. It isn't notes and coins. It's money in the bank. And it's not telling you any more about it than that. It could be its own long-term deposit. You don't know, but it's just in the bank. But it's there. Now, the one thing about this, very strange thing about this, you look at that line. Ethel's running a supermarket. She's got no cash in the bank, no bank account. If you look down the other assets, there's all your assets. That's all the things that belongs to the companies, the businesses. There is no cash in Ethel's supermarket. How is that possible? Anyone like to shout out an a reason for that that makes any sense? All you guys that have done accounting before, what would you say? Is it possible? You've got a supermarket. People come into the supermarket. Nowadays, most of them in this country will be bringing in credit cards and bank cards or even phone apps that have got the supermarkets up in it. But there's still people pay most money. Um, in fact, I went into a shop end of last week, and the only thing we take was cash. And the smaller shops are more likely just to want cash. The one I was talking about earlier that I live that is near me, before COVID, he would only take cash. He wouldn't take credit cards at all. So, where's the cash? Yeah, but you still got the cash. You can't give people an overdraft. Oh yeah, then you get that. But that's, that's yeah. That's true. If you've got an overdraft, then you're not you're not likely to have anything up in this in that line there. Whoops. But in a shop, if you've got an overdraft, it doesn't matter. You still need cash. Right. What's going on here is it's the end of the business year. So in order to finish everything up, and the 1st of January is always a holiday, finish everything up, everything gets put in the bank account. So it's nothing special that there's no, there's no cash, and there's no cash in either business put in the bank account. And Ethel hasn't got any cash at all. She's got no bank, because further down, you go into the liabilities of things that are owed. Well, Nothing. So where is Ethel's money? She took out all. Eh? Took out all on drawings. Say that again. She took out all of the money in drawings. Well, she well probably. So there's absolutely no money, no cash, no bank, and no overdraft for Ethel. Archie's got money in the bank. Now, if you're thinking of investing in either business, you can you can buy the excuse that it's the end of the year, so that. The, the money's been deposited. So that's Archie's okay, and anyway, it's a hardware store, so maybe only credit cards. Ethel supermarket with no bank amount, no overdraft, and no cash, that's a bit strange. So you begin to wonder about this business a little bit. Now, I've taught this maybe 10 times, this example, 10 different years, and that's the first time I've ever gone into this particular issue. There's a lot of issues in these two financial statements, and it just depends what you pick on. So you can write about which one would I invest in and pick lots of different reasons for your choice. None of them will be wrong. So whatever decision you make is right. But if you, as long as your reasoning is right. So I'm giving you a reason for being suspicious about Ethel, that's all. Now, down at, that's, so that's all your assets. Now, one thing that's missing in that list of assets is, uh, all right, hang on, okay. I, I, Ronak Raj, do you want to say something? Online? No. Okay. 
We'll carry on. Um, what you see there are the assets. Now, in a balance sheet, you normally expect to see the assets split between what used to be called long-term assets and what uh, used to be called short-term, um, between current assets, which are things that will belong to you for no more than the next 12 months, and non-current assets, which are things that are going to last longer than that. And they are treated very differently. So if you look at the ratios that we use in this subject, and you'll have seen in the, in the textbook or somewhere else, they differentiate between the current assets and the non-current assets. So in the end, what you have to do when you're dealing with a balance sheet is make sure that you separate in your mind the current assets from the current liabilities. Sorry, the current assets from the non-current assets. This hasn't done that, so you have to physically make a change to it um, so that you actually realize what numbers you're looking at. So what I did when I was working through this is I just put a line there. And that tells me these are the current assets. And so that's the current assets. And then the non-current assets are below that. Very simple. But in order to use some of the ratios, you have to um, find out what the totals are of each of those two groups. So in the case of Archie, his current assets total is 30, 50, and 60 to 110. So he's got 110 current assets. If you look at Ethel, she's got 80 current assets. And how do I know they're current assets? Because if you look in the textbook, you'll see a listing of the things that are current assets, and you take that as your Bible and just follow it. And if you don't have the textbook, you just go online and find out what current asset is, and it'll give you a list, and it's the same list. Um, one thing that you'll also have to do with the current assets is to, to find out what the total is without the inventory. So find the total of current assets minus industry. So the current assets are 110. Current assets minus inventory for Archie are, is 30 plus 20. It's 50. And for Ethel, it's going to be 10. And you keep doing things like that with the rest of the balance sheet, trying to put things together that you're going to need later for your analysis. Now, if we go down below that, you've got liabilities, which are the things that the business owes to other people. And under that, you've got two items only. You've got the accounts payable, which are the amounts that you are owing to your suppliers. And you have the mortgage. Now, for those of you who don't know, a mortgage is a, is a loan from a financial service provider, a financial company, a bank, on property. That's land, buildings. That's it. So that's a long-term liability. You're not going to pay that back tomorrow. It's a mortgage. Um, whereas the accounts payable is a current liability. Your suppliers want to be paid soon. So we've got to, to distinguish between them. So the accounts payable is a current liability, and the mortgage is a non-current liability. And that's what I would do with that. And that means when you come to use the ratios that need the amount of the non-current liabilities, you just look at, at the, the balance sheet, and you see the number 80,000 under Ethel for that. Then you get total liabilities, and you, if you take the total liabilities away from the total assets, you get net assets, and net assets is the same as what's called equity. That's the, what the owners have in the business, what they've invested. And the owner's investment comprises of the capital. That's how much they've put into the business. That's the amount they've spent in getting the business. And the retained profits, which are the amounts they've kept back from the profit over several years. In this case, it's only this one year. So retained profit, 16, and that's the same as the figure in the income statement up at the top. And for Ethel, 12,000, the same as the end of the income statement. And that one line, the retained profit line, which is often as, or used to be shown as, no, well, I'll do, retained profit. That's the link between the two statements. You expect the same figure to be in both. Otherwise, you've got a problem. 
Now, this retained profit figure shown here in the balance sheet, usually that would include other years' amounts. This is the only one year it's showing. Where it's showing a bigger number, you need to go to the notes to the financial statements, and in there you'll see one of the numbers will be the retained profit for this year, which you can check against the income statement. So it's not always obvious on the balance sheet what, where the amount has gone from the income statement. So you need to look at the notes. That's just one example of why the notes are really important. So this gives you the total owner's equity, the 160,000 for Archie and Ethel, both the same. So both these, this, you can take this, you remember the PowerPoints for this week? You can take this section here as the value of the business. So both businesses, according to this, are valued at 160,000, so they're the same. And that's the information you had. Now, we obviously haven't got time to go through all the things I would then do. But apart from just thinking about what the numbers are telling me, I would do a lot of ratio calculations. And I'm going to show you all that. This example, as I said before, has no right answer. But it's a lot of puzzles in it. A lot of things that don't quite make sense. You know, why, why, how is it that they, now this is one that you might not realize, why is it that their salesperson's salaries are so similar? Or maybe you, you think that the 8,000 difference between them is a lot. But how, is it just an accident? Or does it mean they're both the same size of business? And it probably means they're both the same size of business. So we're talking about a very small hardware store. Or it's a hardware store that's got an awful lot of clever uh, markings on the shelves and security systems in place, and that's really not going to happen. So it's a small shop. They're both small. And given that they're both small shops, small um, entities, another thing to think about is this mortgage. Picking the obvious thing here, the mortgage. What's it doing there? What is it? And remember, Ethel has got a mortgage, and she's got a shop. Shopkeepers, small shopkeepers usually live above the shop or behind the shop. It's probably her house. So if you take over her business and she tells you the business but not uh, nothing else, what's going to happen to the mortgage? Does that the mortgage really that's on the house that she's just saying it's for the shop and so she's putting it into the shop accounts so she can charge all the interest on it when to the business when actually it's She's really paying it for her own house. And she's just using the front room as a shop or downstairs room as a shop. So the, the mortgage complicates things. If you're going to buy it, you've got to find out. So you need to find out what that mortgage is about, what, it's, what it means, before you can decide whether or not you're going to actually get the full value for this. And following on from that, if she's living there, how are you going to, what are you going to do with the rest of the property if you buy the shop, if, she's, if that's all part of the deal? So maybe there's some extra value there that you can't see in this accommodation space, or maybe storage space that is not obvious anywhere else here in the numbers. Then you've got um, the amount that has been spent on rent. If I go back up to that for a minute, the rent is forty thousand for the year for the hardware store, and our interest is thirty-six thousand. So it looks like. Whatever business you take, you're going to be paying out that sort of money to just maintain the business to keep it running. So the level of expenses on that is not that different. And that impacts your decision because this, it's not pushing you one direction or the other. So what you're left with is just thinking about this mortgage. Do I want to own the property that I'm working in or rent it? If I want to own it, then Ethel's is the business for me. I want to rent it, then Archie's is the business for me. And a lot of people who are buying small businesses will be thinking about this because they want somewhere to live at the same time. And if you actually own the property, then it's a bit more, in a sense, secure. On the other hand, if they've already got somewhere to live, maybe they don't need that, so they'll go to Archie's and just rent. And remember, or you don't know, if you rent, the rent ends, the lease ends, so you can walk away, you can just leave it. If you own something, the only way you get rid of it is to sell it. And that can be very difficult when the economy is going downwards, where it's in trouble like it has been for the last couple of years. So you've got the financial numbers. Think about what they're telling you, and I've gone through some of the things, the obvious things. And 
then we have beyond the financial numbers you've got just the contextual things you need to take into account and it's only when you start looking at the contextual factors the qualitative factors that you really start to be able to build a big picture so keep that in mind one of them is the mortgage you've got to deal with that another one is the type of business which industry is more secure which of these two industries is a better one to be in which is an industry that will generate for you a lot of cash a hardware store or a supermarket a supermarket people come in and pay they buy things for 40 pence 50 pence a pound the hardware store most of the things they buy are going to be um, five pounds and upwards there'll be a few cheaper ones but not nearly as much in a small shop that might sell uh, children little uh, 10 pence sweets 20 pence sweets you know, it could be a lot of things it'd be a lot of cash turning over so they're very different and all that stuff has to be taken account at some point now what you do having thought through those all those things or afterwards you think about them afterwards take the numbers and build some ratios from the numbers and I'm just going to try and do this with one hand effectively. Right, if we take the gross profit margin, whoops, I've got to be careful with this. If we take the gross profit margin, uh, which you may or may not have come across so far, it's the difference between the gross profit and the sales revenue. And the gross profit is 240,000 in both cases, sales revenue 800 and 1200. You need to do that, calculate that as a ratio. So you do what I did there. So you take the gross profit divided by sales revenue, 240 divided by 800, 240 divided by 1200, and you convert those into, and you turn them into percentages. So you get 30% and 20%. So in terms of gross profit, Archie is the better business. That tells you that instantly, which means he's getting more profit from each pound he, spit food he puts in, in terms of goods. He's getting 50% more gross profit than Ethel is. So his goods, on the face of it, are more profitable. It's more profitable to be selling goods in a hardware store than it is in a supermarket. The next thing, the next ratio that I'm going to show you Net profit is a percentage of sales. The net profit is shown here, it's 32,000 for Archie. It's 60,000 for Ethel. The sales are the same, 800 and 1,200. And that's that ratio. So you've got uh, 32 divided by 800 and 60 divided by 1,200. Archie's 4% and Ethel's 5%. So it's switched. The net profit, Ethel is the better business, more profitable business. Now, why is that? Well, it could be because Archie's not been very clever about controlling his expenses. So you look very quickly at his expenses, this bit. He's got 208,000 of expenses, a lot more than she's got. So where's the difference? It's obvious, it's advertising where the big difference lies. So he's got 64,000, she's got 24. So it's 40,000 extra expenses there. He's much more costly in trying to make his sales. And he's having to spend a lot more to attract his customers to his promotion, his adverts. So basically he's pouring money in to try and get the volume of trade in. And in this result, his net profit is falling. So that tells you a little bit how hard it is, much harder it is to make money in his business. Uh, the next one, current ratio. The current ratio is the uh, current assets divided by the current liabilities. Now, the current assets were, um, I did it up here, Archie's 110,000 current assets and Ethel was 80,000. And if I go down to the current liabilities, they were just the accounts payable. So it's 40 for Archie and 60 for Ethel. And you make a ratio out of that. And what you find is that's 10 minutes to go. Uh, you get these two numbers. So in the case of Archie, the current ratio is 2.75 and Ethel's 1.33. And that tells you that Archie can pay his the people he owes money to 
more easily. So that's why we do that one. Have you got any problems with liquidity? You can pay. You're going to get the solution that you're seeing there. You're going to get that when you get the solution to the exercise. So you don't need to photocopy or, or sorry, photograph it. Um, so that's that. But that's not. We don't stop at that point because one of the biggest problems for any store, any shop, is its inventory. If it can't sell its inventory, sorry, it, it quite often cannot sell its inventory. Things go out of fashion. Um, or things just disintegrate over time. Um, I was in a clothing shop today looking at socks. And you pick up a packet of socks. Someone's gone into the packet and taken out a sock to see how long it is and then stuffed it back in. I'm not going to buy that. And the shop's not going to sell that. So the inventory is based, that's the sort of thing that happens with inventory. So you've got to find out what impact it has on the whole situation. So you do the same thing, but you take the inventory out. We call that the quick ratio or the asset test ratio. So the inventory has been taken out and already did the numbers on that. So for actually it's 50, for ethyl it's 10. And when I show you the asset test ratio, you get actually goes down to 1.25, which means he's got £1.25 easy to acquire or get hold of money that he can pay to every pound that he that he owes his suppliers, whereas Ethel can only get 16 pence because she's not got many current assets without her inventory. So Ethel's business is a very dodgy one if she doesn't just keep turning everything over and getting cash in and out quick. So you do that. Now I'm also going to be doing uh, the return on capital employed just now. I'll just show you it gearing, which is the relationship between the funds from the provided by the owners and funds from elsewhere. And remember, one of these two businesses has a big loan mortgage. Uh, interest cover, which is what I'm going to talk about when I show you. I've done inventory turnover days, which tells you how many days you keep your inventory. And that is very important in any business. How many days inventory have you got in stock? And the longer that is, the riskier that is. Um, inventory turnover times. How many times in a year do you turn over your inventory? And that's important for obsolescence, um, um, sell-by dates, all that stuff. And whether it's good to have a small number of days or a large number depends on the industry, and as all of these do. So just to show you those ratios, and I'm going to focus on the interest cover one. Those are the other ratios that are calculated. Now, the interest cover one is net profit divided by interest. And this is one you've got to be careful about. Because normally, when you do this with companies, you're going to take operating profit before interest and tax. It's a line in an income statement. You wouldn't take the net profit. But when it's a small business like this, they don't have that level of detail that you'll be seeing in company accounts. So you've only got a net profit. And so you've got to interpret it slightly differently. With a company, you'd, you'd look at what you've got and you'd say, You've earned enough to pay the interest X number of times. With this situation, it doesn't quite mean that. You've got 60 of net profit and you get interest to 36. So you've got 1.67, which means you could have paid that interest 1.67 times with that amount of profit. But that amount of profit is after the interest. So you've got to add the interest back. So in this case, even though the, the ratio that you, you're taught by me says the answer is 1.67, the real ratio, the real answer is 2.67, because the top line should be 96. You need to add the interest back. So be careful about that. Um, but with companies, as I say, you just take the correct line in the income statement, and then that is not an issue. And that tells you that in Ethel's case, she could have paid the interest 2.67 times, not 1.67. So when you see it, just remember that. Finally. Once you've done all these ratio calculations, you put them all together and you try and get hold of ratios from previous years and ratios from the industry and competitors. Because just looking at a business in isolation doesn't help. These two businesses cannot be paired so because they're in completely different industries. So what you need to do to decide which is the better investment is to go and find out what other shops, other supermarkets, and other hardware stores, what sort of profitability do they make? 
what is their what's their business profile like? I mean, how much do they rent? Do they do they own the property? Do they rent it? Do they have big inventories or not? And only once you've done that, got the industry figures or competitive figures and the ratios to compare, can you make a decision? So the answer to the whole question you were given, which one would you invest in, is well, this one looks the better investment, but I don't know, I won't know for sure until I get information about competitors and other firms in the industry. Plus, I look at what these two businesses were doing in previous years. And that's it. So you'll get the solution I've shown you uh, at four o'clock. Anyone's got any questions? Just email me.